And welcome um, to our 162nd uh, webinar. And um, today we're going to hear from uh, Professor Simon Marginson. Um, and he's going to talk about knowledge networks or hegemonic hierarchy, dynamism and power in global science. So that, that sounds really fascinating. And as most of you will know, Simon is Professor of Higher Education at the University of Oxford, and he's Director of CG, funded, which is funded by the ESRC. He's also the Joint Editor-in-Chief of Higher Education, and he's a lead researcher with the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And most of Simon's research focuses on global and international higher education and the contribution of higher education um, as a public and common good. And also he delves into the murky water of, of higher education and social inequality. Okay, well, um, before I hand over to Simon, um, let's get some uh, protocols um, uh, 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 up and running. So the first thing is that please note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, and a transcript of the webinar and also the chat function will be posted on the CG website um, after our session. Please, can you keep your, um, yourself muted unless you're asked to speak or unless you, um, unless you want to ask a question? Um, and similarly, you can have your cameras on or off as, as you so choose. We recommend that you use the speaker view, which is the button on the top right corner of your screen. Um, so you can see more clearly um, who is talking. And in terms of asking questions, could we ask you to type them out in the chat function, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then at the end of Simon's presentation, um, if your question is selected, you'll be asked to, in, um, to ask your question and turn on your, um, your, your, your camera. And I'll give you, try and give you a heads up about um, if your question, if, if you're going to be asked to address your question to Simon. So now um, it's with great pleasure that I'm going to pass you, all of us back to Simon. Simon, the floor is yours, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. It's a pleasure to be on the other side of the introduction process for a change. And thank you everyone for, for tuning in. It's nice to see such a range of people um, for the topic of the global research system. Now I'll, I'll go to the screen share at this point. Today's webinar is about global science and so it's about knowledge because at the heart of it you know we can think about science and universities too as being about power and money and all those other things we're quite used to talking about but actually they're also about and in case of science primarily about knowledge and knowledge is not something we're used to talking about or that we have a good vocabulary conceptual framework for understanding because it's one of the most unusual things that we deal with in, social, in the social world. It's um, remarkably collective and individual at the same time. It accumulates like a language. It builds, it has strong common elements and much diversity and location as well. Uh, it's about the past and most of what we think we discover is based on what someone else thought of before. And we're just building on that a little bit further. It's also about the future because what we discover and, and, and circulate in the form of knowledge then becomes the basis for many other things. Knowledge is quite powerful, but it's only powerful because it's associated with institutions, structures, practices, agent, agency. So um, knowledge is a, it's, it's, it's an indispensable element of human affairs. It eludes easy understanding and definition, and it's immensely open and dynamic. Knowledge production and knowledge flows are distinct from capital flows or political power or social valuation of status and, and, 
and people, but it intersects with all those key processes in universities and science institutions. So what the, the topic of science, I think, as a sociological problem is about the relationship between the peculiar features of knowledge and these more recognizable things about economies and politics and social status allocation and reward that we're more used to talking about. What I'm going to do today is talk about some empirical tendencies in what I identify as a primary system, the global science system, and also um, ask some quick, quick key questions and try to answer those key questions about global science. Questions which are, are on the edge or underneath all of the literature uh, and are never quite resolved. Now, global science is, um, took a tremendous step forward when it became uh, the subject of electronic communication after 1990 and the invention of the internet. And really we can date the contemporary social science system, sorry, is contemporary global science system from the emergence of the internet because it created a worldwide community which didn't exist in, in the synchronous sense before. So we can now talk to each other on a constant basis, exchange data. And all of that is still rel relatively new in, in human terms, but it's made an immense difference. And what it's done is it's created a pool of scientific work, which is both the published pool, but also what's pre-published and being exchanged and talked about, uh, primarily mediated through electronic communication. And also science is constituted at the global level by the relationships between people, by science associations and, and societies, but also the individuals and the research groups and the way they collaborate and talk to each other. And this is empirically represented by citation, the process whereby we, we acknowledge each other's work and also um, by co-authorship. And much of the literature, the enormous growing literature on global science is around co-authorship and collaboration and what drives it. But what we have here now is a, a relational system, the global science system, this pool of common work associated with human relationships, which to some extent overshadows the national science systems. They, can, they were the primary form of science prior to 1990. They're still very important. Uh, and national science is organized, not like a, a relational community, a kind of network like global science. It's organized in institutions and policies and resource flows and structures, uh, which give it more conventional definition and give it a sort of structural force which the global system doesn't really have. The global system is just an association between people on a voluntary basis. National science has got all the force of, um, of institutions and, uh, and governments behind it. But um, and national science intersects with global science. There's a lot of uh, work, if we might say, that is in both places at once. Uh, it's been developed nationally, but it's also part of the global system at the same time. It goes everywhere um, in the strong science countries. It, even work which is not doesn't involve international collaboration is part of the global system often. Um, and uh, but there's also work at national level which doesn't really enter into the common global conversation. It might be in national languages other than English, or it's just simply about local issues and problems. So there's a sort of sense in which the global science system doesn't contain all the nations in it. It, it sits across the top of them. And I've tried to represent that that relationship in this diagram. So what I want to talk about today is a, some empirical tendencies, as I said, and some key questions. And the empirical tendencies, which I'll run through in order, are the rapid growth of the global science, its diversification amongst many more countries, uh, the growth of cooperative uh, work between uh, cross borders between authors, the pluralization of power, partial pluralization of power within the global science system, and the process whereby the global has become more important than it was before vis-a-vis -vis the national. So let's first go to growth. Well, this is a spectacular story. Um, we've got growth at about 5% a year in the number of papers uh, being produced in the recognizable, recognized global literature, the Scopus and Web of Science, and I'm only using Scopus data. I mean, my data are coming from, ultimately from Scopus, most of them, and through the National Science Board collection in the US. Uh, I'm also drawing on some Web of Science data which come in through Leiden ranking and on OECD data on national uh, system performance and 
levels of investment in, in, in research. But this table is from Scopus. It shows you that the locally produced, not non-collaborative, just either joint authors or single authors within one institution, locally produced science hasn't increased very rapidly, but there's been a big growth in both the nationally co-authored papers and the internationally co-authored papers, which have grown from less than 100,000 to close to 600,000 over this 12, 22 year period. So you can see that the dynamism is in the co-authored work and it's the co-authored work outside your own institution. Uh, and this is networks. This is, this is the electronically mediated relationships which the internet have made possible in, in great volume. If we look at the same kind of trend blind, but we look at it in terms of um, uh, the major regions, you see the United States slow growth, but it continues to grow in terms of output. European Union more pronounced growth uh, due uh, partly to the incentive effects of European collaboration and European research and funding schemes. And one of the big stories of the last generation of this, which is the 22 year time period here, is the rise of, of Western Europe as a science power. I mean, it was always important, but now it's become more important than it was. And, you know, there are very strong systems, not only Germany and France, which are large systems, but there's high performing medium and small systems like Netherlands, the Nordic countries and uh, Switzerland are, re do very well on the high citation side of, of the sciences. Uh, but you can of course see the growth of China and that will be a theme I'll come back to. Uh, Japan, very little change because there's been practically no change in the funding of science in Japan. And so the, the output has virtually been unchanged, but India is growing and India is now the fourth largest science power. Um, India with its low per capita income of 6,000 US per head is nonetheless uh, producing nearly as much published science as the UK, not nearly as much high citation science, but certainly in terms of paper volume, a big player, and it'll pass the U UK in the next three or four years. So India is in restoring its time honored global um, position as along with China, uh, one of the two biggest countries in the world. It will be one of the two biggest countries eventually, I think in science as well. That will take some time because the United States is, remains an enormous player in terms of volume as well as quality. Right, so that's growth, but let's look at diversification. And diversification is about the spread of science capacity and at the, at the level of national science systems with their own PhD training, training um, facilities and the capacity to reproduce themselves internally. The spread of that capacity beyond uh, the Euro-American duopoly that traditionally ran world science beyond North America, Western Europe, UK and Japan, and of course, Russia to the rest of the middle income and high income countries. Um, the rest of the Europe has come in and all of the European countries, including the smallest ones, except for the tiny, tiny postage stamp ones have their own science systems now. And, um, and you see this, for instance, in the former Yugoslavia, the Balkans countries and so on, they all have presences in the global science literature, which go beyond just co-authorship with American advisors or, or UK doctoral supervisors. Um, they, they have their own capacity. And um, that same process of rolling out of, of middle income science systems is occurring in East and Southeast Asia as well. Uh, and uh, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, all despite their relative poverty at national level also have science systems. Latin America, uh, slower, but it's happening. And um, Africa is the last cab off the rank, but we are seeing now a rapid growth from a low level in the number of published papers coming out of African countries as well. Now this type, this graph's interesting because it shows you the countries where the rate of growth of science has been particularly rapid since 2000 over the 18 year period. So these are countries where the rate of growth, the annual rate of growth exceeds 5% a year. So um, that's quite staggering. When you think about, you look at the figure for example for Iran, second fastest growth in the whole table, 21% a year. So science outcome in English, published work in English is expanding by a fifth each year. And you keep doing that for a decade and you've got a lot more science and you keep doing that for 20 or 30 years and you've got a great deal more science and the country grows from being a minor science producer to one of the biggest in the world. And that's what's happening in Iran. Indonesia, country of, you know, fourth most populated country in the world, but a slow emerger in terms of tertiary education and science is now, is now it's now happening. 
In Indonesia, we've seen growth of 26% a year over this 18 year period. So it's beginning to become a significant player on this in this table, moving towards 30,000 papers a year. And at that rate of growth will become a major science producer over the next generation. So um, a, big, a, a big change in the world. So with, with science becoming part of the normal apparatus of societies, you know, like a water supply, proper water supply or a school system or a, or a hospital system, science is becoming part of that basic infrastructure of a modern society. And increasingly all countries that are building uh, modern societies want a science system along with everything else. So you might say that roughly, I suppose, in the world, there's probably about 60 countries now where you could talk about a developed science system and the number is increasing. Um, so that's diversification. It's no longer a Euro-American property. And this is another way to look at this process of expansion. The number of countries that produced 90% of the world's science in 1987 was 20. So 20 countries produced 90% of all the science published. By 2017, that's 30 years later, it took 32 countries to constitute that top 90%. And the number of countries that produced half of the world's science was only three in 1987. It's US, UK, Germany. That's now six. So you see this pluralization is showing itself uh, with the rapid growth of the, new, of the new players in science growing more quickly than the old players. And you see this, this diversification process. So science is becoming a normal part of human affairs. Global collaboration growth, probably no topic more focused on in the world science literature than this. Well, this is a, again a 22 year span and you can see that the this great growth in the number of internationally co-authored uh, co papers, papers with um, two authors or more uh, with uh, in two countries or, or more. And most papers are, are, are only have a small number of authors. I mean, to some extent, the collaboration rate has been kicked along by these very large paper teams which have developed, but um, that's not the main driver. Uh, and, and it's mostly small groups, small collaborations that have really driven the, you know, the expansion in the number of co-authored and percentage of co-authored papers. But we're moving up towards one fourth of all papers being internationally co-authored. And there's a, another 40% that are co-authored between more than one institution at a national level. So collaboration, cooperation is the name of the game in science. And you, but you see a lot of variation, variation by country, variation by discipline. And it's the pure sciences, the pure natural sciences where you get the highest level of international collaboration. Classic case, of course, is astronomy and astrophysics, where more than half the papers are now interna involve international collaboration. And uh, a lot of that, of course, is driven by the large scale projects like um, shared electric uh, telescopes and, uh, and observational vantage points around the world, where this equipment is, is accessed by dozens of different countries and science teams. And, um, and often that, that, that triggers large scale collaborations. Same in physics with the big um, Collider and other uh, synchrotron and other um, projects there, and uh, in the biological sciences, increasingly a site of large-scale team activity as well. Uh, ec ecology and uh, geoscience uh, also generating large-scale projects uh, with many cross-country um, participants. It's different at the other end, isn't it? Engineering much more local, much more national, and. Um, uh, Social science, predominantly uh, national matter. Um, much of what's in the global literature is really just the parochial concerns of um, the English language countries and Western European countries. Uh, so social science is mo mostly not about um, big universal questions. It's mostly about problems and solving problems and they're often locally nested. Um, so social science tends to be uh, a site of uh, a lower level of international collaboration, a higher level of national and local collaboration but um, social science, along with everything else, is seeing growth in the rate of co international co-authorship. And the international co-authorship landscape is associated with these immense uh, collaborations between the researchers from one country and the researchers from another country as groups. 
that isn't to say that collaboration is actually driven by nations exactly. I'll come back to that question in a minute, but you can, of course, the shorthand uh, facility of the databases which are organized in national categories allow us to see very clearly that um, there are sort of certain broad highways of collaboration at a global scale. Now, what's interesting about this table when you look at it closely is that almost every collaboration is between an English language country and another English language country or between an English language country and a non-English language country. Of the 20, I think it's 24 colla uh, collaborations listed here on a nation by nation basis, only four of them uh, involve countries which are not English speaking. So you see the central role that the English speaking countries play in the sort of network structure. And this is a very simple way to see it. There's been a lot more, more elaborate network uh, studies which give you that centrality as, as well, but it but it's, emerges quite simply here. Uh, you can see how important um, that the US, UK, even Australia and Canada are in the scheme of things. Germany also a major player in a number of these collaborations. Uh, and, but it's, and again, the larger European countries figure. Um, Europe has very high levels of collaboration due to the operation of European science funding, um, particularly um, collaboration inside Europe. Uh, and uh, outside Europe, Europe collaborates about the same rate as the United States, but inside Europe, it collaborates enormously. And that leads, uh, puts the European countries at the top of the list in terms of overall uh, collaboration picture. Okay, let's look at the question of, interesting question of diversification of power, um, multipolarity as some call it at the global level. Well, there's really not one science system, there's really three. Um, physical sciences, STEM, including mathematics and computing and engineering and so on, um, dominated by this, this presence from China and East Asia um, in terms of numbers anyway. High citation science too, increasingly located there still strong in the US and Europe, but really this is this, this, these important strategically significant disciplines where probably most of the world competition really is in terms of technology um, are the most plural in terms of distribution. Iran is also a major player, for example, in the rest of the world category. Brazil, I mean, the emerging countries are focusing more on physical sciences STEM than they are on the other two wheels in this uh, chart. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, a very interesting that uh, physical sciences STEM wheel because it, 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 it really expresses the pluralization I've been talking about throughout this presentation. Um, the, um, I mean, the sheer weight of science in, in this field, these fields in China, it's just enormous. I mean, the US and EU combined are smaller now than East Asia and China combined. I mean, this is very, this is work being done in English. So these are East Asian countries for whom English is not a natural language, shall we say, it's a long way away from their linguistic base. They then nevertheless acquired English language science at scale and are delivering enormous numbers of outputs and they're putting them into the world literature. Um, and this is, this is an enormous change in human affairs. I mean, go back 30 years ago, only Japan was a player and it was much smaller. Biological and health is different. Europe, a really big player, the Anglophone zone, if you combine the US with um, the UK and the EU category and Australia, Canada, the Anglophone zone is very large in biological and health. And um, in the US, for example, half of all papers are in this category. Whereas in China, it's the other way around. I mean, half of all the papers, more than half are in the STEM, physical sciences STEM category. In, in the US, it's, uh, it's more than half are in biological and health. So, uh, and China and East Asia are much smaller players, but they are growing uh, significantly there in biological and health. In social sciences, East Asia, almost out of the picture, the social science is local. It's being published more in national languages. Uh, and there's, those disciplines play less of a role in higher education than they do in Europe and in, uh, in North America. And EU, very important player in social science and psychology, and US, of course, uh, probably the, the strongest in terms of quality. So diversification, but across the disciplines, very different pictures, isn't it? And if that's not quite all of the disciplines, I mean, if you had geosciences, agriculture, and so on, a few others, you'd find, again, they're, they're intermediate cases, but you'd find more variety there again. 
In terms of uh, high citation science, the, the uh, shorthand for what's high quality, of course, citations are not a perfect measure of quality at all. Some of the most path-breaking work doesn't get early citation. Uh, some of what is cited is just simply recycling stuff, which is available elsewhere and probably doesn't deserve to get the citations it does. Um, but citation is the measure we have at an aggregate level to look at relative um, recognition of the work. And um, the US continues to be the strongest player in terms of uh, top 1% papers. Almost 2% of all its papers are in the top 1% category, which is almost twice what the world average is. The EU is rising up in this group and um, China has passed the, the world average point. Um, and so its work is now being cited at above average rates, partly because of its own people who are much larger number than they were citing that work, but partly also the rest of the world seeing that Chinese science is useful. Um, there are a significant number of papers, of course, which are Chinese and American combined. And those papers tend to do quite well in terms of citation. Interestingly, the um, China leads more of those collaborations than the US. Um, and most of them are about, there's about twice as much Chinese money in the US China collaborations as there is American money in terms of research grants. So it's been, it's been it's actually China led and more China funded than American, but that collaboration between the two countries has produced a lot of high citation science. That um, collaboration is now in jeopardy, I think, because of the uh, geopolitical tension between China and the US. The, the story of course is the rise of East Asia and uh, the, the shaded, um, zone gives you the growth in the number of papers coming out of China, which is, and you see the, the, the steep curve there, that's the increase in expenditure in China in real terms. So you can see that it's almost a perfect fit between the growth of funding and the growth of output. And that's often the case in science um, at, in, from country to country, uh, that you see this relatively good correspondence between growth of output and growth of uh, funding. Interestingly, in the UK, uh, the growth funding has been kept at a quite a modest level, but clearly there's a high efficiency in the UK because uh, the output has risen a little bit faster than the funding has over the 20 year period, over the 22 year period. And the output of high citation work has grown very well. So the UK is getting more bang for its pound um, over time and Saudi Arabia is the opposite. Lots of money going in, uh, but the output is somewhat disappointing. So the correspondence between resources and output of science is not always perfect, but in the case of China, it's quite, um, it's almost instrumental, isn't it? Um, although they don't look like they're increasing much, um, the others are increasing and Korea saw a tripling of the uh, real level of funding over this 22 year period um, and in, um, uh, in Singapore also, uh, significant growth as well. We haven't got the figures for 2018 in Singapore, the dotted lines, but uh, in Japan, virtually no change in funding. And that's why there's been virtually no change in output as well. Now this is, um, I suppose the top end of the, U of the East Asian Chinese civilizational zones achievement in world science. This is the, the position in terms of top 5% papers in um, physical sciences and engineering on the left and mathematics and complex computing on the right. Now you see Tsinghua is now top of the table worldwide in both categories and well ahead of MIT in the physical sciences and engineering and the top seven in mathematics and computing are all Chinese. Now again, English language literature, think about it, what that constitutes as a kind of cultural achievement. I think the building of Chinese science in, in a 30 year period is on par with the achievements of the space race in, in um, America and, and Russia, USSR in the 50s and 60s. It's really quite phenomenal what's been done and we don't know what its potential is in terms of longer term, but it's still increasing, growing. The quality improvement is now keeping pace with the quantity improvement. Um, and you know, if it, it, the sky's the limit, it seems. China's planning to put more money in raise its, its R&D rate from 2.2 to 2.5% of GDP over the next four or five years. So uh, yeah, and, and in a small way, the same thing's happening in Singapore, which again, phenomenal achievement. You see in both of these tables, Singap the two Singapore universities appear. Nanyang, which is threatening to overtake National University of Singapore as the top university in Singapore, uh, but both doing really, really well. Uh, and uh, the physical science and engineering a little bit more shared, 
Uh, you see the um, uh, a presence from um, ETH Zurich, the top uh, European science university. Uh, Cambridge is in there. Um, but basically, what we're now talking about is China and Singapore. And in, in, in the US is really other players at the top of the physical sciences STEM cluster. Very interesting and a massive change from the position 15 years ago. And you see this, the dynamism of it here. This is the leading East Asian universities in each East Asian system. Top seven in China, see annual rates of growth in high citation research are between 13 and 25%. Now, increasing high citation research by 25% a year, that is something else. Um, and in Singapore, the achievements look more modest and yet seven and 12%, um, or 13% in the two universities there. Whereas at the same time, Hong Kong, not the same funding growth, very good universities in Hong Kong, but they're smaller and they're not, they don't have the same funding driven dynamism that the Chinese and Singaporeans have. Uh, Tokyo U, just like Japan as a whole, steady state, not increasing its high citation output. Seoul University in Korea, slower rate of growth, but significant 5% per annum in high citation work. But in National Taiwan University, the top research university in Taiwan, uh, again, budget constraints, a bit like Japan, not quite as constrained, but not growing very much at all. Uh, and the comparators, the mature system, MIT in the US, steady 3% growth a year. MIT still, um, in terms of top 1% papers, slightly ahead of Tsinghua, still, still a tremendously important university in STEM terms and will remain so, uh, as will Berkeley and, uh, and Harvard and others. But um, at the moment anyway, um, the, uh, the, the running is increasingly shifting to China. So let's get behind these uh, figures, Claire, and think about um, you know what you know what what it all means. Uh, and I'll better speed up a little because I can see that I've developed too long on some of these figures. Um, so what what drives global growth? Um, is global is the global science system taking over uh, from national science? And these issues are the subject of significant research attention. I mean. The conventional understanding outside the science literature is that national governments drive research activity, but the science literature provides a lot of evidence suggesting that science activity is driven within autonomous universities by autonomous research groups. And it's really about the networking between those research groups at a world level that drives collaboration and co-authorship. Um, and their work is very visible to each other you, there are a lot of advantages in, in collaboration, um, you know, come from division of labor, uh, division and pooling resources, maximizing the impact of what you're doing, building your status and prestige that way and so on. But there's been two primary explanations. One, one relates to what is called preferential attachment. Is that scientists follow trails of personal advantage. They network with people who are going to help them help their career. So they network upwards. Scientists go, go to higher citation scientists or people with established reputations, work with them, seek to partner with them and so on. And you know this is why junior researchers seek out senior researchers, and we all know that happens. Or people from emerging country systems seek out researchers from established country systems uh, and so on. What preferential attachment is basically about us all being driven by self-interest in a kind of competitive positional market, um, and it's uh, and it is and it assumes that um, those those impulses are primary. But I think there's some holes in the explanation for me. I mean, what um, why do established researchers then embrace all these collaborations enthusiastically? Why are they, do they encumber themselves with with the you know with networking downwards so much? Um, and um, and they, they must be getting something more from it than uh, than the psychic thrill of dominating someone else. Um, and you suspect, therefore, that the other line of explanation, which I call cognitive accumulation, the idea that people work together for intellectual reasons because they pool ideas, they, they share uh, insights, they, they do something more than they could do on their own intellectually, uh, and they, there's excitement in that, and they, and they look for discovery and they think their prospects of discovery and being seen to be the first are better when they're working with other good people. I mean, those explanations seem to make a lot of sense as well. I suspect that um, 
both cognitive accumulation and preferential attachment are in play. And often they're in play at the same time and they re reinforce each other. But my own view is that after looking at much of this literature for the last few months, is that um, uh, it's unduly cynical and uh, about self-interest and positional advantage being the drivers. And I think knowledge is, 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 is a larger part of the explanation. The particular content knowledge is a larger part of the explanation than most of the literature suggests. But then uh, I'm becoming less rather than more cynical as I get more experienced. Is global science coming to dominate? Well, some people argue it does. <coughs> it, it dominates already in some respects in the patterning of activity at the national level. I think this is a, the empirical um, side of this is unclear. And um, uh, we're waiting in some ways to see uh, now that the, there's more geopolitical pressure on the science system than there was, we're waiting to see how robust global cooperation will be vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, pressure exerted by national governments to change the pattern of activity for geopolitical reasons. Um, but uh, certainly the global system has become very strong in its own right. And um, although it may be somewhat fragile under pressure, uh, the significant point I think that's emerged is that nation, nation, national governments don't control what happens in the global system and the pattern of global collaboration. They can influence it, they can control it at the edges, but they don't control it overall. Um, and it has an independence, it has an autonomy. The global system essentially rests on the autonomy of the system and autonomy of researchers. And while there's free dealings with each other and the individuals concerned are free to make decisions about science, then that those condi conditions will continue. So. I think national science will remain a very strong factor in the larger countries and the stronger science countries, but the global system is to some, some respects beyond its control. And that may be a very good thing. And I'll come back to that. So this is towards the close now. Um, how do, should we understand the global research and science system? I mean, I think that um, most of us are brought up with certain no, no, notions of how it works. And they're quite simple notions. The idea that nations are competing with each other for technological advantage. And that's what's driving national science. And that's what the global science system is. This competition between nations, the arms race and innovation as it's sometimes called. Or the idea that it's a market of competing universities, world-class universities, kind of rankings imaginary. Or it's, a, or it's a center periphery hierarchy with the dominant science countries controlling knowledge everywhere and drawing on the talent from everywhere else and keeping everyone else in un, in a dependent and underdeveloped position, or the more positive vision, it's a flat network, it's open, it's growing because of this, and it's a shared space and it's not very hierarchical. And all of those notions, I think, have some substance, but um, some of them don't stand up very well to scrutiny. I mean, it's easy to see how competition drives investment at national level, but given that collaboration is such an important part of the system, to, to imagine the world science science in terms of competing armies of technologists and researchers sort of facing off against each other like corporate employees is a mistake. It's That's not what actually happens. Um, and a collaboration rather than nationally centered competition seems to be primary. I think competition for status in science is important, but that's not expressed through the national grid. And one of the problems we have in science is that all of the data or most of the data are expressed in terms of national categories when it may not be the nation that's actually driving science, scientific activity at all. It's much more likely to be the discipline and the disciplinary networks. The WCU idea is even less, I think, grounded in reality. I mean, this is the idea that institutions, universities are driving scientific performance and activity. Uh, again, runs up against the, the fundamental empirical problem that most of the collaboration is occurring bottom up. It's occurring outside the framework of institutions it's occurring freely and it's occurring on a disciplined basis. And the institutions welcome that when it works for them, they glory in it when they do well in the rankings, but basically they're adding value, they're providing the infrastructure, they're helping to fund things, but they're not controlling the production and they're not controlling the relationships. Um, so th I think they probably of all the four imaginaries, probably the WCU one has got the least grounding in terms of reality. Um, I mean, elite universities matter, uh, and there's no question that science is very unequal and elite universities concentrate much of the activity in, to themselves. They're, they're engines of status, 
uh, and, and achievement, but um, that it doesn't mean that they actually are science. Center periphery idea is probably along with preferential attachment, the idea of the center periphery world dominates the thinking in the science literature. And um, this is basically the idea that just come out of world systems theory, Wallerstein, 1970s, uh, and it's influenced by the development studies literature, uh, the dependency theory, the idea that um, the world is essentially a kind of imperialist um, plaything of uh, the United States and Western Europe that they dominate and control. Uh, the rest of the world is held in a condition of underdevelopment. Uh, as a result, there are outliers of the of the duopoly, Europe, Europe and America. There are there's also Japan, which never quite fitted any of these frameworks. But um, essentially, that's the world that, of, of the 1970s. I don't think that world applies particularly well anymore. And um, the the difficulty that um, center periphery ideas run into is that clearly. Uh, permanent under underdevelopment is not the case, that there are many countries breaking out of that restraint, developing their science systems. They're often using different, you know, a different path of development to the, what occurred in, in Europe and North America. Um, some of them are developing strong national structures, a lot of robust national cooperation, selective reliance on international collaboration to help build capacity, but basically nationally driven. Others are uh, networking heavily internationally, using national international strategy to build their capacity and and establish themselves scientifically. Probably the run, you know less effective strategy because it runs into the problem that that when the collaboration and projects finish, you don't longer have the capacity building effect. Um, but it certainly brings you into the main game more quickly than the first strategy does. I mean, you see that the bigger countries like Korea, Iran, China, India. Brazil are using the sort of standalone national development strategy, rather different to what the smaller European countries do who develop themselves through networking with other European countries. Um, but we are seeing the rise up of lots of new nations breaking out of the center periphery constraint. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, and that essentially has exploded center periphery theory, but yet the model is still being rehearsed and recycled as central to um, understanding of the world science system, partly because no one has developed a more credible alternative. I think what we have now is probably not one center or, or two, but we've got several with um, the US and China, both very important, the US more important than China still, and Europe um, more important than it was actually, in some respects, and a lot of medium sized players as well. So you are seeing a kind of more pluralist um, uh, environment and that has exploded center periphery theory essentially. So what about the network idea? I mean, networks are quite explanatory in some ways. They, they Network theory is very interesting and very useful when studying science. It explains why things grow so quickly. It explains why it's such an open environment, why the new players can come in and the so-called periphery countries can work with other periphery countries that are, they're not gatekept, kept by the major players. They're not kept out. They're not made to. They're not made to work through others. They're, they're able to build their own activity directly. They can network with each other, uh, and network theory explains how that happens and why it happens. But network theory tends to downplay hierarchy and downplays inequality. And um, science power is very unequal. It's as unequal as it's as unequal in a different way as the economy is. Um, and and one of the ways in which that shows itself is that the pattern of citation is not based on equality of respect or merit. There are clear cultural biases in the pattern of citation. For example, let's just look at the case of the United States. Now, this, this graph shows you the rate at which Americans cite other countries and other countries cite Americans. The high bars, the, the, the paler high bar is the rate at which other countries cite Americans. And the, the darker, smaller bars is the rate at which American cite other countries. So to, uh, you know, to take the example, the example of France now, um, the world average citation rate is 1.00. So French um, scientists are citing Americans at 1.16. So they're giving favor to Americans. They're admiring them and giving them more respect than average. But American scientists are not giving the French scientists the same respect in return. They're giving them 0.76. And in the case of China and the US, it's a dramatic difference with um, a very low level of respect from the US to China. 
when Chinese scientists go into the US and work in the US science system, their citation rate rockets up. They're recognized as part of the American system and then their work is accepted at a much higher rate. What's interesting is that um, uh, the rest of the world cites the Asian countries and the European countries more strongly than the Americans do. So it is a question of cultural bias to some extent, I think at work here, it's not just a question of the merits of the work, although the strongest science, let me emphasize, remains in the US. Um, and, uh, and I think this shows that the East Asia, Iran, Brazil, they will build and build, and eventually Sub-Saharan Africa will as well. Uh, they will build, but they'll be building science systems on still on American, Anglophone, European terms. Um, the culture of science will still be that Western science culture. And um, uh, it's much harder to transform the rules of the game, the, the leading journal editorships, the language of use, uh, than it is to actually build a strong system with resources and high quality people. Um, so, uh, here we are. Apologies for mucking up my presentation. Here we are, I'll get back to it. The, um, the language factor is key. And I think that the, um, the English lang language hegemony and the hegemony of English language cultures in science and even more in the social sciences will remain strong for longer than the English language countries will exercise economic or even political leadership at a world level. Um, I mean, English is only the third most most spoken language as the first language in the world. It's a, it's a major language as a second language so that it goes ahead of Chinese on that table. But you know, really um, only a small number of countries uh, actually speak English as a first language. And, and yet the English language countries dominate the university rankings, they concentrate power there and they dominate science accordingly. Even though the language of science is in many respects mathematical rather than linguistic. Uh, it's still expressed through English language based conventions and standards and ways of operating. And yet there are other major languages, aren't there? I mean, Chinese is widely used in the world. Spanish is widely used. Um, it perhaps ought to be a global language, shouldn't it? French is still widely used. And then Arabic, and there's got a big chunk of the North Africa and the Middle East. So as a primary language there, so you can see the potential for at least to become a major regional language, but in science, it's all about English and it's about learning English as one of the obstacles that emerging countries have to go through. So let me close Claire by asking the final question, which I'm not sure about the answer of too. And that's uh, about the autonomy of global science. You know, is it, I, I, I see an enormous amount of free development here, which is, it's just snuck out from underneath the control of national governments and it's not controlled by markets. I think one thing we can be pretty clear about is that capitalism doesn't control science. It can, it, it operates at the edges of it. The publishing system has influence on the mode of scientific production. It speeds things up, I think. It probably exacerbates the, the emulation, the prestige competition, the, the publish or perish syndrome and so on. Probably all of that are encouraged by the publishing industry, but the publishing industry doesn't define the content, doesn't drive the content of the work and it doesn't establish the relationships. So. Capitalism takes over a sector in society when it structures the relationships and it shapes production. And that isn't gonna happen in science because once, once that happens in science, as Leidersdorf says, science can no longer make scientific decisions, can no longer make knowledge-based decisions. If the market becomes determining, it no longer works, science starts to disappear. And if you make the same point about political control, uh, Direct political coercive control prevents science from operating properly. And it, but it's a slower process and there's a compromise in the middle where some autonomy is permitted, but government has a lot of control. And I think that's how some governments would want it like to steer us. I mean, but the, the limits of government intervention are shown by what happened in Nazi Germany, where the greatest Nobel Prize factory in the world was Germany. It was not the United States or England. It was Germany before World War II before 1930 anyway, Germany won by far the largest number of Nobel prizes. And then the Nazis took over and they Nazified science. They took away the, the, the autonomy of researchers. They forced the universities to 
compliance with the regime and the universities were at in their soul was broken they lost their scientific spirit their capacity to collaborate worldwide all those things were diminished and german science is still recovering from that terrible blow that terrible waste of of human endeavor and knowledge production potential that was in germany before the nazis took over so this is a clear warning i think to governments that seek to intervene too forcefully in the next period to uh to drive a cold war approach either from china or from the united states to science if they do that then ultimately science itself will wither and um but whether the global science system is strong enough is robust enough to stand up to the pressure remains to be seen but all those sores about institutional autonomy and academic freedom they become very important now because in the next five ten years we are looking at a world in which securitization and militarization are rising up directly in the science and technology world and the capacity of um, science to resist that will depend entirely on the robustness and strengths and commitment and values of its human agents so i hope that it's knowledge accumulation and not provincial attachment which is driving them end of Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, so, uh, and if we'd like to start off with uh, Emma uh, Sad uh, La, La, La v, v, uh, could you please um, ask your question? Would you like to introduce yourself and turn on your camera? Thank you so much. Okay, thanks very much, Simon. This is Emma Sabzalieva uh, calling in from Toronto. Um, I work at UNESCO and York University here in Canada. My question is about the slide that you showed at the beginning on science papers. You explained that growth in Japan has been fairly static and you correlated that or corresponded that with minimal changes to the funding structure. So how then could we explain and understand the much greater growth in India over the same period? Well, India has increased its funding um, and that's part of the story. India's a very um, patchy um, last 25 years, isn't it? Because you had a long period where there was very little change in the number of papers. And then there's been an acceleration in the last 10, 12 years. I think it's been partly a result of the um, impact of um, the world rankings competition on uh, state governments and the federal government and the national gov government as it is. In, uh, and, uh, and also uh, in individual institutions to a degree. So. You have a lot of talk about the need to build Indian science in India and a plethora of schemes and funding programs which have gone into that. And those things are impacting the output. Um, but it's uh, one feels that India is, you know, always in need of coordination, isn't it? And uh, if, um, if a more coherent national policy develops out of this period of reform in higher education, which uh, where I think a widely supported and respected uh, government policy statement has been made about lifting Indian higher education and including a substantial lift in R&D, we may well see India start to kick along in more coherent fashion. Great, thank you. David, David Mills. Hi everyone, David Mills, I'm Oxford colleague with Simon, so I shouldn't really be asking a question, but I'll ask anyway. Simon, do you want to reflect a little bit on and the limits of the Scopus data for thinking about emerging science systems where you can imagine the pressure is on academics to publish in Scopus journals, so you might get an over exaggeration of growth. So just the sort of you know working with this with this database, what problems that, that that presents you? I think that has happened in China, for example. I mean, there's been you know with a considerable incentive that was in place to encourage to encourage international publication in in, in science citation index, uh, particularly in web of science. I mean that drove a, no doubt drove the growth rate to some extent. And, and we will now see what happens when with that incentive taken away by the Chinese government, you know, whether that changes the pattern. And I'm sure this has affected overall growth to some, extra, some extent. Um, there are a number of drivers that have intensified production. Um, I'd include the, you know, the publication companies and uh, as well, and, you know, starting new journals, particularly all the time. Um, and, uh, and as well as government incentive structures. So, I mean, there's a, as you know, there's a huge amount of science, which is not in the, global literature. Scopus is now picking up some non-English language stuff, but it's still a fairly small part of the total collection. There's a huge amount of stuff that isn't part of the so-called recognized science set. And it's pretty important, most of it. Um, 
one suspects that you, what you'd always like to see with emerging countries is not, you know, um, sit back and wait, wait to applaud when they reach quite the quasi-American standards of performance, but to see them develop their in terms of their own social and economic and political needs. And that will involve national language work. And, you know, if we had an incentive structure which, which favoured diverse languages and diverse nationally nested approaches, it would be far healthier. That's clear. So there's a homogenizing effect of the global system, which we all have to worry about considerably. I mean, the big, the big problem with globalization always is homogenization, loss of diversity, imposition of, a, of, a, of a, an Anglo-American European standard on things. I think those problems are getting less because of the pluralization of power. Um, I mean, the rise of the East has, has, to some extent, incidentally, freed up the position in Latin America, Africa and South Asia. Uh, it's just given more space, you know, for everyone to be different, a bit different, but it remains to be seen whether that happens. And I think now we're going to this period of intensified geopolitical rivalry that could freeze that process of pluralization and slow down the process of, of, of diversification because um, cold wars don't value diversity, cultural diversity. They only value singular identity. Brilliant, thank you. Great. Alex, Alex Fenton. Yeah, hello from uh, Berlin, thanks for the talk. Um, I mean, your empirical data that you presented were mainly, um, you know, volume measures of numbers of papers from Scopus, and I suppose Scopus itself is, and the other databases are a big part of what have helped us to imagine that there is a, a global science system. But I wanted to press you a bit further on how much those kind of pure volume measures really say much about hegemony in a more sociological sense. And you started to kind of, get onto that right at the very end of your talk, but I wanted to press you a bit further how much just crunching the numbers. I mean, someone will always be first if you count the numbers, but how much that tells us about hegemony in perhaps more substantive sense or the scientific agenda. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that I look at it a bit differently to that and I look at it in terms of um, activity, you know, to see what's going on, see what kind of cooperation's occurring, where things are coming out. Um, and so in that context, you're not so much concerned about who's first, but you welcome a new, a new player. Um, that's becomes much more exciting. But I mean, I think that, you know, David's question also went to this to some extent. I think the homogenizing effects of the, of the systems are very clear. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, intrinsically, there's nothing particularly exciting about um, volume in itself. Uh, even citation, of course, has got many flaws as a measure. Cites are very, um, ambiguous uh you know people cite because they have a, a knowledge debt but they also cite because they want to indicate they're part of a conversation or they want to uh, attach themselves uh for preferable for in a preferential attachment sense to secure advantage by making a citation so i mean there's really three very different meanings to citation and you know only one of them is really about valuation and in any kind of respectable sense uh so i mean but i think the the largest problem is is the is, 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 is that hegemonic systems suppress plurality and diversity, cultural diversity. Um, and uh, we're a long way away from having an effective strategy that will bring forward non-hegemonic knowledge. But um, clearly, part of, it's about building agency and part of that is about stepping away from the established systems and doing things independently. Now, what's interesting about science is that there are some countries who work within the system to promote themselves as successful, but have also done it their own way and built, their, built things in their own interest and become somewhat autonomous and independent within the structure. That, that I think, centre periphery theory will not tell you is happening. It will tell you it can't happen. But I see that happening in these sort of middle level players. And I think, to me, pluralisation and creating space for diversity below is partly about creating plurality in the middle so that the absolute dominance of hegemonic power is reduced. That creates space for national self-determination below the middle level. And I think, so I think the rise of, you know, disparate forces like Brazil, Iran, South Korea, China, you know, it does free up the space for a lot of others, it, regardless of what you think about their strategies of imitation, the extent to which they're following the, 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 the hegemonic path they're not entirely doing so, and they've they've created the potential for others to be more plural. Thank you. Right, and the final question, if Simon, you don't mind asking and uh, addressing another question, do you? This is from um, Ron Barnard. Ron, 
lost you. Oh, Gosh, you um, I, I hadn't intended to say anything. Um, can you hear me? Can you? Yeah. I can. Yes. Um, well, let me ask you this, um, Simon. I've got a book on my shelves in my library, 1966. It's called The Crisis in the Humanities. And there's a, been a literature so over one. the last 60 years on the crisis in the humanities. Now, yeah. one reading of your extraordinary um, material, which I've been fascinated in for some years now, is that the crisis in the humanities is it has been heightened uh, over the last 10 years or so as we've seen the rise of global science which you've brilliantly uh, articulated and made manifest uh, but how would you read it uh, uh, do we need any more to think of the crisis in humanities or shall we just put the humanities in its coffin well certainly not and um and here, of course, many of the answers to our pro problems lie. Um, and, and social science and humanities as a block, I think, conjure up, you know, not only individual sensibility, but relational sensibility and social organisation, social culture. And, you know, I guess that's what's interesting to many of us is all that stuff. And, um, and that's why we work on it. And, uh, you know, the core question of philosophy and its role in, in, in the academy. Um, I mean, I think we've, we lose that stuff at our peril, you know. Uh, the complication, of course, is that those conversations are not a single worldwide conversation. There are many conversations, immensely diverse conversations, and that's the beauty of it. There are many different theoretical circles. There are many different schools of thought, and uh, there are many ways we exchange between them. Um, so a, a good university does those things really well, and not many universities do that. And in the emerging science-dominated universities in East Asia, there's not enough. Um, but yet you'd think the question of say Chinese characteristics ought to be addressed by the humanities in China, but it could only do that if the humanities in China were free to say what they thought about Chinese characteristics rather than having to follow a particular ideological position. I mean, it's interesting that how it's been relatively easy for all kinds of governments, authoritarian or contested democratic and so on, to give science leeway to permit it to work internationally to allow it to develop its own knowledge program but there's not the same leeway or, or, or freedom offered to the non-sciences uh, and yet they continue they survive and many students want to study these subjects that to me shows that they won't disappear uh, what you can't do is have a global a neat set of global data on the humanities which would allow you to put the humanities alongside science and talk about them as a, as a group of things so I, I should have spent more time explaining why I wasn't talking about the humanities in this in this conversation, because I'm essentially a humanist, social scientist. I'm at that end of the social science. I mean, that's my that's my my interest. Um, but I do think humanities can talk about science, and I do think social science can talk about science, and it's really important to do that. And if you look at the um, the psychometric literature, it's it's this positivist attempt to try and explain the world in terms of simple mathematical relationships with vast generaliz generalizability. Very little social theory in there, very little recognition of philosophical problems and sensibility. Um, and what I hope to do today and with my work around this topic is bring to bear social theory sensibility and philosophical questions in relation to science. Because I think non-scientists should talk about science just like scientists do. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Simon. That's that. That's great. That was a um, fascinating talk. And uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everybody else for attending too. Um, and basically, we're sort of continuing the same theme um, very, very broadly um, on Thursday at our next uh, seminar, which is um, entitled The Big Picture bibliometric study of quantity and impact of academic publications from post-Soviet countries. So that's the sort of same time, same place um, next Thursday. See you all at two o'clock then. And Simon, thanks again. Many thanks, Claire.